in one sentence, who is Dr. Ahmed Tekonji? I would say Dr. Ahmed Tekonji is Dr. Ahmed Tekonji. There is no limit of what you people can achieve for your people in this country. We should not be miser. We should not be selfish. We should share this Islam with everyone who is around us. And the Quran says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not get the maximum of the best of the good deeds unless if you give from what you love. What is the best which you have? We open our annual memorial lecture this afternoon by the invitation of Sort of Fatima. Alhamdulillah, in the Shishman of the Deen, Bismillah, in the Rahman of the Deen, Alhamdulillah, in the Alameen, Al Rahman of the Deen, Malik Yom Deen, Yakana, who do I hear and assign, Hina Surah Al Mustafim, Surah Al Ladina, and Ak Malayim, Away from Abdul Malayim, for the Lord Deen. Amen. Now, the procedure will be, first of all, uh, Professor Yom Dali will uh, tell us very briefly in five minutes why we have named this series of annual public, public lectures after Imam Bukhari. Uh, and then I will uh, very briefly introduce our first speaker in the series. And then the Quran of the Pony will uh, deliver the Quran of the letter. Now, Professor Jomi Ben, the Quran. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear brothers and sisters, we have named this series of lectures, Imam Bukhari, the Mario, due to faculty. He is a great scholar in Hadith. And uh, it might be that we are using his book these days, while we don't know Imam Bukhari himself. Now, Imam Bukhari, his full name is Muhammad bin Ismail bin Ibrahim al Bukhari. He was born in 194 Hijri, 13th of Shawwal corresponding to, 20, uh, to 20th July 810 in a place known as Bukhara, the old Khorasan um, uh, province, which is now in, uh, known as Uzbekistan. He is a great Muslim scholar in Hadith due to the fact that he started his career in Hadith while he was 11 years old, and it is said that um, within two years he memorized about um, uh, 100,000 Hadith, and others say that he memorized about um, 7,000 Hadith. Now, what we can recall about him and Bukhari he was very nice. He lost his sight when he was young, but due to the prayers of uh, his mother, his sight and death. Now, we would like to know exactly if we read the name of this series, Imam Bukhari, you have to know the person himself. So here, in fact, um, we are introducing to you Imam Bukhari, and he should be um, um, your hero also. He is the one who has opened us, uh, opened our ears, our, ears, our ears in Hadith, and uh, therefore we have to pay homage to him when we, whenever we read his book, and that uh, we have to change his name in the Muslim notices. So 
He died in um, 256 Hijri, corresponding to 870 AD. And he died at the time when, in fact, he completed his book, Fahir Bukhari, which we are using now. And there are so many things to talk about Imam Bukhari. But in fact, we can talk um, just like that. It is a brief um, introduction about Imam Bukhari. So with this brief introduction, I welcome you to the Imam Bukhari Memorial, our series of the Lord Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, by the way, Dr. Sajnod Ibnani, who is the dean, father of the Islamic studies, is a student of uh, Dr. Ahmed Tony. Just in case you don't know. Now, I want to uh, take a very few minutes to briefly uh, say some few words about uh, Dr. Ahmed Bikondo. If I were to summarize in one sentence, who is Dr. Ahmed Bikondo? I would say Dr. Ahmed Bikondo is Dr. Ahmed Bikondo. That would have been enough. Uh, but since uh, most of you uh, do not know him, I will uh, make an attempt, just briefly, to uh, tell you about him. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Tonji first visited this country in 1975, when almost all of you were not even born. And he came here not as a tourist, but he came here because he was following up issues connected with the Muslim education here in Tanzania. So those who are uh, young enough, I recall, I mean those uh, everybody in the family. But uh, I would like you to note that uh, the Ghana economy has played a very crucial role First of all, in uniting Muslim students all over the world. Way back in 1966, 42 years ago, he was initiating, I mean, this, uh, I mean the efforts to unite Muslim students in all parts of the world. And in this, on 1st uh, December 1966, he wrote a letter which should be written in the letter of God when he was trying to make these efforts to unite Muslim students all over the world. One part of that letter, which he wrote at the time when he was uh, uh, a student in uh, U.S. and Canada, living student there. He wrote a, play, a, a prayer, which I will explain why I think that prayer was granted. Allah granted this prayer, at least as far as he is concerned. When he was concluding that letter about uniting our, our Muslim students all over the world, he said, may Allah bless you and help us all. Now, uh, there are so many things, but uh, I would like to say that uh, Dr. Tonji is also a co-founder of uh, QIT, International Islamic uh, uh, Institute of Islamic Thought. Institute of, yeah, of Islamic Thought, uh, which is the uh, headquarters in hand of Virginia. And he has visited many parts of the world promoting this. So with these two remarks, because you wanted to listen to Dr. Tonji and not to me, uh, with this few remarks, I would like to take this opportunity now to invite Dr. Ahmed Kondi to deliver his uh, annual memorial lecture. Please. Thank you very much. Bismillah <laughs> ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi thumma alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. We need it a bit louder. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بارك الله فيكم That's how we want it So that we will wake up a little bit at this warm day When I was sitting and listening to Professor Hamza is as a rare occasion in this occasion that I would my eyes will have some tears in it because many of the things which he mentioned it was a part of my system of working with the Muslim youth and the students and I really was as though hearing them for the first time in my life when I was really trying to be active in reviving the Muslim Ummah in whatever we can. It touched my heart that these words would have that kind of an influence on a breed of wonderful brothers and sisters in this country, that they took the challenge. And they said that we have to change the condition of our people. And they did. In those days which we are talking about with Professor Hamza, we did not have schools, we did not have institutions, we did not have important officials in the government, we did not have cabinet members that easily and so on. Alhamdulillah, we have come a long way. But that is not where we want to stop. There is no limit of what you people can achieve for your people in this country. Whether Muslims or non-Muslims. It is our duty to take care of the people who are living with us. It is duty on all of us to share the greatest gift which Allah Ta'ala has given to mankind, Al-Islam. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Allah Ta'ala saying himself that I have accepted for you. I am satisfied with this deen which I have given to you. And have chosen it for you. رَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Therefore we should not be miser. We should not be selfish. We should share this Islam with everyone who is around us. This is the best we have, and we share it with the others. And the Quran says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ That you will not get the maximum of the best of the good deeds, unless if you give from what you love. What is the best which you have? And the best we have is Al-Islam. Therefore, since there are no more prophets, no more messages from the heavens, Allah Ta'ala has perfected for us the religion. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دين. That today I have perfected for you your religion. Since the prophets are not there, since new message not there, who is responsible for this message to reach to the humanity? You. You are the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You are the ones who have to bring this message to humanity. لِيُخْرِجَهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ To save them, to take them from this decadence which they are in, from the darkness which they have been living in it, to the light of Al-Islam. And we can do it. I remember I was a student in America when I first went in 1963. By the way, my studies is petroleum engineering. We did not study Islamic studies or we did not have an opportunity to be in an Islamic university and so on. But we had to teach ourselves Islam to be able to survive when I was in England and then in America. 
We had to find our brothers making and sisters make groups, sit down, bring books and read collectively to be able to learn Islam and tell to the others. And I'll give you a very important secret in this. One of the reasons why we were able to succeed and bring Islam to the people and to ourselves that from the beginning we made a, a decision among ourselves and we said we are not going to care what the other people say about Islam. We will listen, we will hear, we will try to correct it but not by fighting, not by wasting our time and putting all our energy in what Islam is not. We said we have to make our energy to how to present Islam positively to the people. We teach the people what Islam is and not what Islam is not. And the example in America was very clear. In 1963, Alija Muhammad, a very great American, African leader, he had taken a lot of things from Islam, but not in the form which we were used to it. Not in the form which our Quran brings it that way. He brought it in a way he thought he will be able to influence the American society, especially the Afro-American there, in a way which he put something from Islam and some other things which he, were ex he was exposed to. For instance, he used to say Allah came to Detroit and his name was W.D. Fard and Muhammad, I am Muhammad, so when you say La ilaha illallah Muhammad and Rasulullah, it's these two. They used to pray, they used to pray on the chair. They used to fast, they used to fast in December because the day was short and they know the timing and so on. He had his own reasons for these things and many other things like that. But also, he asked them to be clean. They have to respect the woman. He said, the women are your sisters, your mothers, your daughters. Would you like anybody to fiddle wrongly with these people? You have to be careful. They wouldn't eat pig, they wouldn't drink. He says, you have to be sober, you have to be human. Respect your mind. And many of these things he had taken from Islam. Now, how do you deal with this? Many people used to say, well, he's wrong and so on, and they are busy just doing negative work. We said, we will not say a word against them. MashaAllah, he is doing a wonderful job. He is bringing some Islam to them, making them clean, making them respectful. And if we are better, let us teach them the rest of it. So do it positively. Now you can see it all over, every day in the newspapers, magazines, radio, TV, and so on. Every day attack on the Quran, attack on the Prophet, attack on Islam, attack on... Before, they were not able to do this before September 11. But now they have reached to the stage of what we call in Arabic, waqaha. In a disgraceful manner, they humiliate themselves by attacking these great teachers in the world. Some of the Westerners have been very just, and they have talked to the, about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which many Muslims cannot talk like that. Bernard Shaw, one of the greatest philosophers, saying that if Muhammad was in our time, he would have solved the, all the problems of the world in less than drinking, say, a cup of coffee. And he was right. So this is what I want really to emphasize to my dear brothers and sisters. Don't be defensive on it. Bring Islam to people. Live it yourself. Exemplify it. And present it to the people as a model. In America, between 1963 and 72, the first period which I lived in America, about eight, nine years, 
about million to a million and a half people became Muslims. We did not have the sword in our hand so that we defend ourselves. We were not ruling in America. The black people in America, they were very much humiliated at those times. I have seen on the, on the restaurants myself with my own eyes in 63. Blacks and dogs are not allowed in this restaurant. In another, blacks, Jews and dogs are not allowed in this place. And you know a lot about American history and the civil rights and so on. This Alija Muhammad was able to cleanse many people. May Allah bless his soul. We went as an executive, I was then 1965 president of the MSA of US and Canada. Went to him, I told him, we know what you are doing. We cannot do what you are doing. And I really believe it even today. We could not do even 10% what he was doing. And we will not say a word against you, although we have some differences of understanding on things. Just give us an opportunity to teach your people Arabic and Islam. Allow us to go to your mosques and give you this. And we made an understanding. Alhamdulillah, we never said a word against him and he gave us access to his people. His son, Warithuddin, Muhammad, who passed away, rahmatullahi alayhi, in Ramadan, last Ramadan, he used to come our study circle in Chicago. He learned Islam. He knew what true Islam is. And he had other elder brothers, and one of them died just about two months ago, Herbert Muhammad. He did not put the other ones after him to lead the, his people. He chose Warith al-Din. And he knows Warith al-Din knows the true Islam. And in one year, we had 90% of the people who were followers of Elijah Muhammad following the true Islam. He was a great man. And he told them very clearly, my father is one of the greatest people I know. He has done a wonderful job and he has brought us to this state. But we are still just moving. We are babies. We want to learn the true Islam. We had a program for all their Imams. And this is very important. When you give the message to the leadership, they know how to give it to their people better than you and I. And with the help of Allah, this about a million and a half people became Muslims. Only about 10% remain with Farah Khan. You hear his name yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah. He's also a good man. He knows Islam. But he still thinks like Elijah Muhammad, this is the way he can only influence the people. It's fine. We will take from there and get them to the other side as well. So if we were to fight, we would have been killed, they would have been harmed. And Brother Malcolm X, rahmatullahi alayhi, Malik Shabazz, when he went to Mecca and had a dinner with the King Faisal, and many other Muslim leaders and dignitaries and so on. He saw the true Islam. The true meaning of the verse of the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu, inna akramakum indallahi atqabu. O oh mankind, we have created you from a single pair, a male and a female, and we have made you into nations and tribes so that you get to know each other, not to despise each other. Indeed, the best among you 
are those who are most righteous. Muttaqeen, the one we were talking about in the khutbah today. A religion where there is no color, no race, no nationality, no place of origin. A man is born in Mecca, he is no different than a man is born in uh, Arusha. <laughs> they are all the same. No distinction except through their actions and deeds and their commitment to the commandments of Allah. Inna akramakum indallahi atqa. Malcolm came back to America, started attacking Ali Jamal. So I went to him and talked to him and said, Brother Malcolm, please, this is not the time of you spending your energy on the negative. We do not have a man like you and your caliber who can get the message of Islam in no time to the people. Put it in a positive manner. And I saw the tears in his eyes. He said, Ahmed, I have taught them the wrong Islam. I have brought them here. What do I do in Yawm al Qiyamah in front of Allah Ta'ala if I don't tell them that you are wrong? I said, Brother Malcolm, but your message is more important. What you can do. But you know, Allah Ta'ala chooses some people to become shaheed. By the way, shahada is not something you aspire for it and you do it. <laughs> no. وَيَتَّخِذَ مِنْكُمْ شُهَدَاء In the Quran, he says, وَيَتَّخِذَ مِنْكُمْ شُهَدَاء He selects who becomes shaheed. In Battle of Badr, who becomes shaheed? Those are known. Allah Ta'ala has chosen them. Even if you try, you get 50 times to the front, nothing happens. And Allah Ta'ala has chosen him, Shaykh. He continued his attack. In a speech, 12 noon, in New York, in a, in a very big hall, in front of him, at least 2,000 people were there. They entered each one from a corner with a gun. And they shoot. We lost a great leader on, on any level you can talk about. I remember one day in New York, he was speaking in a square, and about maybe seven, eight hundred people were there. And we were listening to him. And the whole rain came in such a pouring manner, all our clothes was water. I did not see one person leaving the audience. In this rain, in New York, in the in front of all these people not anybody was willing to leave they did not want to miss a minute of what he is saying he was that kind of a leader so please my dear brothers and sisters it's good to know how to respond the attacks which come to islam but we should have some experts on these this is their job to do it they don't keep all of us busy in this problem Someone like Salman Rushdie, and you hear his name, many of you. This originally Indian so-called Muslim fellow, he wrote a very abusive book on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family. I was then in Wami, in 70s. Our brothers in England and in America and in India, they wrote to me, what do you think we should do? Our response, and of course, when I'm saying I was working with a team of people, and this I will come also to. One man, no matter how good he is, he will make a lot of mistakes. But if we work as a team, our mistakes will be limited. We can correct each other. And we listen to each other and we come to consensus of opinion and we act. And this was one of the greatest blessings of Allah Ta'ala which gave to our group, to our team, to be able to work for so many years together to serve the Ummah in the most effective manner they can. It is not difficult to make a team. We want 
each one in their expertise, they fill one part of the issue which we are in. We do not need all of them to be like Khalid bin Walid or Abu Bakr or Umar or Ali or Uthman or Talha or Zubair. We need all of them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his strength was that what he did, he knows what is the personality of Abu Bakr, he knows what is his point of strength, and he knows where he is weak. He pushes them in the area where he is best and grow and become a giant. He does not put him in the area where he does not have expertise or he is not strong enough. If you bring Khalid bin Walid and put him in place of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he will not be able to do a good job. Or if you bring Abu Bakr and put him in place of Khalid, he cannot do a very good job. But each one of them in their position, they are giants. So when you put these giants together, they cannot be defeated. And that is what exactly the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did. Their number always were very small and the enemy were much bigger. And they were able to defeat. Because he had made the team for them. One of the things which he taught them, مَن تَسَاوَى يَوْمَاهُ فَهُوَ مَغْبُونَ This is a hadith in this training guide of Islamic workers of Brother Hisham al-Talib. مَن تَسَاوَى يَوْمَاهُ فَهُوَ مَغْبُونَ If two days passes by you, and you don't make some improvements in the next day, you are a loser. Which means, I don't accept, the Prophet tells the Sahaba, I don't accept from you to remain the same level as you were yesterday. You have to improve. You have to learn more. You have to do things better. You have to be more friendly with your friends. You, when you go to your home, you'll have more smile. Anything but positive new approach on things. That is how these wolves of the Arabia, each one of them were like an individual wolf. He brought them, he tamed them, gave them the khuluq al-Qur'an, the character, their character became character of the Qur'an like himself, and he let them bring nur to the humanity. The first 13 years in Mecca, in the da'wah, everything was going worse. More persecution, more torture, more difficulty, to the extent that the Prophet وسلم, himself had to think to leave out of Mecca and go to Medina. And of course, in Medina, he found that things are, will bring to a takeoff. You know, the, the plane taxis for a while, <clears throat> then it takes the full speed. It takes off, leap. And this is exactly what happened in Mecca. They taxied until they reached Medina one or two years and so on. It leaped. In 10 years, they brought the topmost civilization ever has come to humanity. And with a people who did not have any <clears throat> knowledge, who did not have any education, who did not have this, except the education of the Qur'an and the tarbiyah in the school of the Prophet ﷺ. They went through a lot of difficulties and training in Mecca. You think those muhajireen, many people can equal them? He trained them 13 years. They were able to move the world. One plus one is equal to 11 إذا كانوا على قلب رجل واحد. What does that mean? <clears throat> one plus one is as effective as 11 people if they are in synergy. The word synergy, they are understanding each other. They work in unison with each other. Each one by just indicating knows his brother what he is meaning and what he is doing. This is ala qalbi rajulin wahid. 
and he made the Sahaba like, like that. One plus one plus one, 111. And I know it from our own experience. As a group, we worked, we applied, and Alhamdulillah, we accomplished. When three people work ala qalbi rajulin wahid, they are able to produce as effective as 111 people. Put one more. As effective as 1,111. I am not joking, brother. I have tested it. We have done it. We have made a lot of changes in the world through this dynamism of the prophetic method of bringing these people up. Still, up to this point, the formula of Umar radiallahu anhu is more effective than our formula. Because he sent four people to Iraq when they needed help. He said, I send you 4,000 people. <laughs> Sa'ad looked around, where is the 4,000? <laughs> he saw them. And they changed the whole strategy of the battle in Iraq. They had a problem with the elephant. One of them went on the shoulder of the other with the spears. They hit the eyes of the elephant. The elephant went in the other direction with the enemy instead of against them. They were a team of greater than our four, one plus one plus one. But when they are five, my formula is better than Umar radiallahu anhu. It becomes 11,111. And they cannot be beaten. You can do it, my brothers, my sisters. You can do it. It is your responsibility to do it. Your brothers and sisters in the past, they have done it. You have to do it better than us, better than our generation. You have the, the Quran with us. You have the application of the Quran in human society and a successful human society in Medina. You have the example. It can be done. It's not utopia. It is doable. The Prophet did it. And you have the experience of the years of the people before you who have done it. Take the best out of these people and bring your innovativeness. Change the condition of the ummah. You can do it. And inshallah, you will do it. This team spirit, collectiveness, is extremely important for us to do. واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرق. Take hold of the covenant of Allah, the rope of Allah, and be not disunited. You can do it. But there is a technique to do it. Many times the Muslims, they want perfection from the people. If someone 90% applying Islam and he has about 10% hazy, we forget about the 90% who is common with us. And we emphasize on that 10% and we get divided. The Prophet wasallam took from the Sahaba as they are and he upgraded them gradually. We have to do the same. This is 54% full. I don't care about the 46% which is empty. In everyone whom we deal with among ourselves. 54% is plenty. There are people who do not agree with us even 1%. There are people who are 0% and they are our friends because they are not fighting us. There are many who are minus. They are fighting us by every possible means. So when you have someone 50, 60, 80, 90%, this is wonderful. Learn to accept your brothers and sisters as they are. 
and work with them to improve yourself and improve them to be better than what they are. We can do it. How is Brother Ahmed Tutunji? Oh, Brother Ahmed Tutunji is a very good fellow and so on. But, and he makes a list of 10, 15 negative things about him. As though there is no, nothing except these negative things about uh, Ahmed Tutunji. What is the correct way of doing it? Brother Ahmed Tutunji is a very good brother. And number one, he is excellent in this, he is excellent in this, he is excellent in this. Give him the things which is positive about it. The full part of the glass, not the empty. Everybody will love each other. To the extent if you have only one good thing in your brother, and he is doing so many other bad things, forget about it, you don't know about that. You know that good thing. And I'll give you a practical example. Last night I was talking with some of our brothers and I have a very practical example which I fulfilled. There was a brother with me in Pennsylvania State University when I was a student in America. And this brother used to go and do every haram which you could think of. So it's not only that he used to do this haram, it's fine. He would come next day and graphically explain in front of these young people all these things which he did physically. Now how do I handle this fellow? And he was a very jolly person and lovable, really. So I told him, brother so-and-so, you are a very nice fellow. I love you. And I really was sincere with every word I told him and still remember it. This is about maybe how many years ago? Uh, 64, 64, 44 years ago. Told him, brother, I want you to come just pray Friday prayer with us. I know it's difficult for you, all the prayers and so on. I'm not asking you too much. Just come and pray Friday prayer with us. He said, all right, sure, brother Ahmed. Even for your sake, not for Allah, for Ahmed Tutunji's sake. I will come and pray. I told him, but you have to come clean, proper wudu, everything is in order, and so on. He said, I will. And really, about six, seven weeks passed. Every Friday, every Friday, he comes and prays with us. Now, we had a meeting for the leadership of the Muslim organizations in America, in my city, small city, Penn State, middle of Pennsylvania. And those days we could not afford planes or like that. Someone will come by bus, the other one will come by train, the other one will come by plane, whatever. They were coming, so I told the brothers, we, we had about 20 Muslim students on the campus. I said, I cannot handle this alone. I want all of you to work with me and help me. And I used to help them in their studies, do assist this and assist that. So we had a very lovable relationship with them. I said, Fulan, your job is to be chairman of the reception committee. He said, me? Chairman of the reception committee for all these great Muslims are coming? I said, yeah, of course. He said, but Ahmed, you know what I am? I said, I, I do know very well. You pray with us every Friday, every Friday, every Friday. He went and brought one of them from the train station. And he came and I introduced him to him. He said, you know this brother who came and met you in the airport? His name is so-and-so. And he is a very fine person. I love him. And he prays with us every Friday, every Friday, every Friday. He looked at me. Went and